test that? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? No. no. Did you turn that one on? It's yeah. on. I did turn it on. Good afternoon. How are all of you today? Good, good, good. Um, I know this weather has been a little more Seattle-ish. Um, we Coloradoans aren't used to this. However, isn't it beautiful and green out there for a change? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> And um, when you get finished with the conference here today, the forecast is actually for some sunny days for our Memorial Day weekend. So something to look forward to, right? Um, for those of you that don't know me very well, I'm a fourth generation Coloradoan. And um, I have been very, very actively involved in the city of Thornton <clears throat> for a number of years, <clears throat> volunteering time as well as I decided to get into the pol political foray by getting on the board with my HOA, my local HOA. I wanted to try to help make a difference. We needed consistency with the rules, and we needed um, people that really cared and weren't going to play favorites with anyone. From there, I decided to run for city council. So I served as a city councilor for seven years, uh, two terms, and then last year had an opportunity to run for an open seat at, down at the legislature in, in District 24, which Northland is, all of Northland is in Senate District 24. There's a third of Westminster and two thirds of Thornton. So I have taken my leadership uh, roles very, very seriously and did the best that I could, worked very hard on behalf of the citizens of Thornton, and now I'm doing that on behalf of the citizens of Senate District 24, as well as the rest of Colorado. I believe we represent everybody, not just those in our districts. I've been a small business supporter during all of this time and have been actively engaged with the small businesses in Thornton and learning more about the businesses in Northland and the ones in Westminster as well. I partnered with their city councils on a number of things, so I did have some background knowledge of what each one of those cities' challenges were and some of the things that they're doing that are good for their citizens. I actually looked up what assisted living was because I wanted to see if there was a definitive definition. And lo and behold, there isn't. There isn't a nationally adopted de definition, but there are several definitions that you can find when you Google assisted living. One of the definitions that I found was housing for elderly or disabled people that provides nursing care, housekeeping, and prepared meals as needed in an assisted living facility. Another one said it's a system that provides a place to live and medical care for people, such as the elderly or disabled, who need assistance with their daily life activities. So the businesses that you guys have, the role that you play in our communities is very important. The largest segment of the population that is growing right now in Colorado and across the nation is folks that are over 60. Within the next four years, that number is expected to grow by 40% here in Colorado. And baby boomers are moving here from other states to be closer to their kids and their grandkids. So as you know, there is going to become more of a need for the types of facilities that you all either manage or own. So it's very important that we make Colorado a great place to live, not just when you're a working individual or a young person actively involved on your own independently, but once you need to have help being independent and to live a good quality of life um, when you no longer can on your own. The philosophy of assisted living is, is a service that focuses on maximizing each resident's independent and dignity. And I do believe that that's what you all strive for. That's what we want to see as, as residents in the communities that you have your facilities in. That's what we want to see for our loved ones, parents, grandparents, um, children, whoever may have to, to, uh, to be placed to live in a facility where they can be cared for when a family can no longer care for those individuals. It takes involvement of the community and the community leaders as well. And I don't know, by a show of hands, how many of you have actually talked to your state legislators or your city council members at any point in time? Good, more than I had thought, so that's great. Um, it's very important that you keep 
in touch and an open line of communication with your local city council members, your city staffs, and of course your state legislators. I also encourage people to uh, contact your congressional delegation because all of those folks in Washington, D.C. need to know what's going on in Colorado and how the laws that they're enacting back there on the Hill affect us and how sometimes the laws can conflict with each other or we're butting heads against each other uh, like we are with marijuana right now. <laughs> you all have the challenge of trying to balance your costs as well as being a competitor in the marketplace, trying to get trained, good, compassionate employees that will remain with you long term because we all know it takes a lot of time and money to train employees to do a, a, the job that's needed in each one of your facilities. And we, the residents as well would like to see the same familiar faces on a daily basis because that gives people comfort when they have routine and they have people that they know and feel comfortable with. I served on the advisory committee on aging as a board member, I was an alternate board member on the Denver Regional Council of Governments or Dr. Cog. It's not really a doctor, it's a group of people that get together. There's 56 board members from across the, the uh, metro area that uh, are members. And they make decisions not only with regards to what's happening with the agency on aging, but also with, with regards to transportation here in Colorado. So they get federal funding. And I'm here to tell you the federal funding is drying up. It has been for a while not only with transportation issues, but also with health care and with aging, with the aging population. We heard from a member of an agency back in D.C. that states were going to have to start figuring out ways to fund programs and other things that had to do with this growing aging population, that they simply don't have the funding, and they're not going to. So they're looking at us to be creative, to be innovative, and to continue to give the best quality of care that we can to those that need our services. Across the nation, unfortunately, we haven't prepared very well. We haven't prepared very well for our aging infrastructure, and we haven't prepared very well for this silver tsunami that has already started to hit and will be growing substantially in the next few years. Many of the residents in your own communities want to stay in their communities, whether it's in a patio home or an assisted living home. They want to remain in the community that they raised their children and their families in, that they have been a part of for a number of years, sometimes 50 years or more, and they don't want to have to move somewhere else. So I think it's also critical that you also work together to figure out how you're going to make your industry and your business better for everyone. Not only the residents who choose to live or are placed with you to live by their families, knowing that they're going to get the good quality of care that they deserve, but also so that you can be successful from here on out. The economy is shifting, but very, very gradually it's shifting. And so we haven't seen that huge bounce back everybody was talking about. It's been a very slow, gradual change. But it's people like all of you in the room who are the business owners, who care about others, and who want to see your businesses survive that have made Colorado weather this whole recession much better than we otherwise would have. Like, like I said, we still have a lot of people that are moving here from other states. Why? Because Colorado offers a good quality of life. They like what they see here, and gosh, we're friendly people, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. I've heard that from a lot of folks that are, are here to visit, that gosh, I didn't know Coloradoans were so friendly. Sometimes we go a little overboard, but you know, that's great because it's not the same way in, in other parts of the country. I had to write down notes because it's been a long legislative session. This was my first one. And um, I still haven't had a chance to really uh, recoup from that yet. Another thing that I'd like to impress upon you that it's very important, when we as legislators and lawmakers enact laws, sometimes we think we're doing what's best. But unless we hear from all of you, 
what the challenges are, the benefits, or the potential unintended consequences might be, we might enact something that would be detrimental. And I cannot speak for anyone else but myself, but I certainly don't want to see that. I want to see the businesses that you all are a part of survive and thrive successfully. We need you to. The people of Colorado need you to. So it's going to be very important, as I mentioned before, that you take the time, pick up the phone, send an email, talk to your state representatives and your state senators. You don't even have to talk to your own um, district person if you prefer not to. You can talk to any one of us. I believe that we're all open to listening. I certainly am. During this legislative session, what I tried to do when people came in was listen. Listen to all sides, pros and cons. Ask what the fiscal note was going to be, because that's always important, because this year Colorado had the largest budget we've ever had. Uh, by the time that all the bills get signed into law that the governor has on his desk, we could potentially be nearing $27 billion. But the budget that was approved was $25 billion. The governor still had 350 bills coming across his desk, as well as an additional 25 um, the last week following the session. Now, he did mention that perhaps not all of those would get signed into law, but who knows which ones they are, and I don't know what the fiscal notes are that come along with those. Because um, sometimes there are amendments that are put on to bills that don't necessarily, uh, weren't necessarily approved in one house, but then got put on in one of the other houses. So does anybody out there know how the process works? If you want to come down and testify for a bill, what happens is a bill gets introduced by a legislator, probably because someone in the industry or your lobbyist has come and asked us to consider running a bill that would be beneficial to all of you in your industry. Then what happens is it gets drafted by a legislative drafter. All of those folks are attorneys. So they look at everything to make sure that nothing is in conflict with current Colorado law or federal law, and then they draft the bill for us. Once the bill is introduced on your specific House floor, in the Senate, in my case, then it gets assigned to a committee in the Senate. Oftentimes you can tell what the success of a bill is going to be depending on which committee it gets assigned to. Committee, the committee <coughs> that any of the bills that affect you should really come to Health and Human Services, which I serve on. But they can be assigned to other groups. And it doesn't just, a bill doesn't just have to go to the State Veterans Affairs Committee to die. It can go somewhere else and not be successful as well. So once it passes through the committee, it comes back into the Senate, and we debate it on the floor. It's introduced. I would introduce a bill and say, colleagues, I'd like you to support this bill, and this is why. You explain what the bill is. Sometimes people will come up to the microphone and say why they're not going to support it or why they think it's a good idea. But if it passes out of the Senate, then a Senate bill goes over to the House, gets introduced, and the same process happens. It gets assigned to a committee or multiple committees, depending on if there's a fiscal note involved and, and what, what it is. And if it passes through those committees, it comes back to the House floor for debate. If it's successful there, that's when the bill will actually make its way through the pipeline to the governor's desk for his signature. So there was a bill this year that I assisted with, but it came towards the end of the session, and the end of the session, if any of you have been down there, is very, very crazy. I would like to say that we are very respectful and a little more reserved in the House, I mean in the Senate, and the House is very, very chaotic when you go in there. But there's a difference, too. The House has 65 members, we only have 35. We do the same amount of work as the 65 members do in the Senate, but it is an imperative that bills make it through both houses if they're going to become law and be helpful to anyone. I've had the opportunity to work with the Kyle Group and with others in your group, and that's important because if we don't see you, if we don't hear from you, we don't know that there are challenges out there. We may not know that you're having issues regarding something specific. We don't know if some bill that we, someone else is bringing forward might be detrimental in the long run because 
of potential unintended consequences. Because when bills are being thought about, sometimes people don't look at the whole big picture. I do try to do that. I try to listen, and I try to be very thoughtful with the decisions that I make. But it's imperative that I have open communication with all of you to be able to do my job well. I'm no different than any of you. We all want to be successful. We all want to help people. We want to um, be able to thrive and have good quality of life here in the Coloradoans. We just have some different jobs. And my job, and I am tasked with trying to represent all of you, as well as the people in my district, to the best ability that I can. I don't want to enact bills that are going to be harmful to the business owners. I want Colorado to welcome new business. And your industry is going to be one of the fastest growing industries in the next five years. So it's critical that when we enact laws that have to do with regulation or governing, guidelines, that you all be involved with it, that we hear you, your voice is heard. The time to do that is to come to the committee hearings. That's the public process. Yes, they all are recorded, but you get your day to talk about why you support something, why something is going to be negative for you. Offer solutions as well, because legislators can actually do amendments to bills. As I said, we're very busy when you read all of the bills. I have to be quite honest with you. Did I have time to read every single bill? No. What I did, what I chose to do, was once I knew a House bill was coming over to the Senate, I would read it after it had made it through our committees because I knew it was going to be debated on the floor. With the Senate bills, I did the same thing. If it made it out of committee, I made sure I had um, gotten the information so that I could make an informed decision with regards to the bills that we were going to be hearing. Do all of the legislators agree all the time? No. And sometimes we have very different ideas about things. But that's OK. That's what democracy is all about. Unfortunately, there were some good bills that originated in the Senate and some good bills that originated in the House this year that didn't make it anywhere. So my motto, which I hope your model is too, is patient persistence. We'll be bringing back the assisted living bill again next year, and we'll just strategize a little differently. And if you have ideas that might help in when I am trying to persuade others that this is a good idea, because as you know, there are people in the legislature where if you're asking for licensure, if you're asking for fee increases, or you're asking for things that we've never done before, they're going to scrutinize very um, closely and some of them just flat out won't support it. So my job is to try to gain enough support for things that matter to you all and to the residents that you are serving and the families that you are providing services for to make sure that we have a good system here in Colorado, one that we can keep our employees, one that we can keep our, our residents safe and happy and living a good quality of life, and one where the families who have folks that are in your assisted living facilities can feel confident in the care that they are receiving, making sure that you all have had uh, professional development and education, continuing education, because quite frankly, technologies, medical equipment, the way we do services now, everything is changing. And it, it's a work in progress. It will be changing as we move forward. Um, if you've seen any of the sci-fi movies, who knows what could happen in the future and how we're going to be. But you all play a very important role in our society and in Colorado for our citizens. So I want to just reiterate that I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me this afternoon. I didn't want to take up a lot of time, but I wanted to impress upon you how important your involvement is with your legislators. I cannot do my job well without hearing from you if there are bills that are coming forward that are going to affect your industry. So please do feel free to contact me or your own district representatives and senators to let them know, yes, support this, don't support this, this is why. But stay involved, participate in the hearings, let your lobbyists and your board members know what's important to you, 
And keep your eye on what's going on down at the Capitol and under that gold dome down there. Also keep your eye on what's going on on the big dome back in, in Washington, D.C. Because as I said, very oftentimes, they won't enact legislation that then we at states then have to work very hard to try to comply with because it's like oil and vinegar sometimes. So I appreciate all the work that you do. I want to see you all be successful and thrive because that just makes our communities and our state better. And I like to be a role model for the rest of the nation. I think Colorado's done a good job of that in many areas. And I think this is another area with assisted living that we can also um, have a great image and a great model that others want to follow. And, you know, like I said, you're going to have a lot more folks coming to your facilities here in the, the next, near future. So uh, we want to see everybody working together. And again, I appreciate your time. And don't hesitate to ask questions. I ask a lot of questions. I, I'm told I'm a squeaky wheel sometimes. But I can't do uh, what I do or make informed decisions without getting the information that's needed from all of you. So thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of your day. And we will, um, we will all look forward to sunshine. <laughs>
somebody else's idea might be good for a small segment of people, but not for the greater good of folks in Colorado. So we have to be very careful and really look at the bills that we are um, going to potentially pass or not pass. And sometimes the bills just frankly don't have enough information in them or they have not been thought through properly, in, in my opinion, my personal opinion. Um, or maybe it's just a bad bill. So the bills that came through this year, if they didn't move through the process, they died. And if a bill is uh, postponed indefinitely, it's like history. But you can bring forth that bill the next year under a different title or a, and a different number. And so I plan to do that. As I said, patient persistence is my motto, so <laughs> I don't give up very easily, especially if I think of something's really important. But I have to know it's important to the groups that it's going to affect and the businesses that, that it's going to affect. So tag teaming on that, when we were talking about bills being brought back um, the next session, if we have comments or concerns or questions mm -hmm. or things that we want to bring back to you, yeah. um, what is the, the timeliness of that? When is, when is the most appropriate time to present that stuff to you? By what time period that it would be considered when those bills are brought back to the table? Well, um, the Kyle group can actually help, and so can your board. Um, most boards for any organization are carefully monitoring the bills that come forward, any of them that have any potential for affecting the business that you guys are in, uh, health care issues, which also affect you. Uh, so the earlier, the better. Once a bill has been introduced and they know it's going to go to a committee, you need to jump on that right away, and if you've got concerns, let us know. Um, the bills are read across the desk in the Senate or the House, and they're assigned to a committee. At the very beginning of the session, it might take a while before it gets to that committee, or it might not. At the end of the session, things move so quickly that it gets assigned, and it's like boom, boom, boom. I, I personally don't like the late bills at the end of the session. I think you have a better opportunity to vet your concerns and be at that public process at the committee hearings earlier on in the session when things aren't so rushed. And I think people are, are listening and really paying attention to what you say. Uh, at the end of the session, I have to be quite honest, we're introducing bills in other committees. We're running back and forth. We're trying to listen to what's being said in our own committee. So it can be very, um, very chaotic time for us legislators as well. Um, I don't think that that needs to happen, but it does. So. This was a good learning experience this first year, but earlier, the better. And the Kyle group and your board members can also help you with that. Senator, in the, that you're involved with the healthcare side, many of us have either employees or residents that are Medicaid eligible. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to happen to Medicaid in the next 12 months? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> And unfortunately, I really can't. Um, we didn't really have any bills that um, majorly affected that this year. But there could potentially, because the percentage of Medicaid recipients has gone up substantially. Yes. And one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that in order to qualify for Medicaid for an assisted living facility and others, other types of medical care, you can't have any assets at all. And we've had issues with Connect for Health Colorado. I'm also on the oversight committee for that health exchange. Um, so we are meeting during the interim to try to see how we can improve that whole process with the board. I was also um, talking to them about that. That's a concern that they have as well. Um, I suspect that we will have other bills come forward this next year, but I can only think of one or two and actually they weren't major, they were just fixes to a process and added a little money into um, uh, the system for a particular program. But we are actually in the process of taking a look at all of our agencies in the state. My personal opinion, and this is my personal opinion only, is that every agency in the state is a, is a business that is funded by all of you as taxpayers. 
and they should be run like businesses, just like you're expected to run your businesses um, in healthcare and, and assisted living. So we are actually in the process of taking a look at a number of our agencies and offices um, that deal with Medicaid patients, um, sometimes very well, sometimes not so well. So I think that there probably will be additional legislation as it's needed, um, but there wasn't anything that was too concerning this year. On a budget level, increase, decrease? There was a huge increase this year uh, in the budget. Um, Medicaid and education take up a good portion of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize it, but 37% of the budget is actually goes for education in different forms and fashions. So um, we're trying to make some improvements there. We want our kids to be thriving and learning, but we also need patients to be able to get the medical care and the assisted living care that they need as well. So um, I do think that we'll see more of that next year once we get a little farther along in the process of looking at some things. And the Joint Budget Committee is meeting, will be meeting again uh, towards the end of summer. And they take a look at all of the potential cost increases for next year for the budget. So they're very, very busy. Um, I'm quite frankly very glad I'm not on the joint budget committee. Because um, they live and breathe that stuff. And they're actually housed in a building across from the Capitol so that they can be um, have their hearings over there. And, and um, they've got a plethora of staff that help them with the uh, details. And it is very detailed work. And there are a lot of complex decisions that have to be made with regards to those programs. And you have to keep in mind that the reason that we fund things sometimes is because of prior laws that were enacted. We have to be able to fund those programs and those things. So um, it's, it was a challenge this year, and it will become even more of a challenge, I think, as we go on. And as you guys know, cost containment is something that we all strive for. However, costs don't go down. They haven't been going down, and cost of care has not been going down. So that's something that we're all going to have to work together on because we don't want to price ourselves, like with education and some other things too, where people can't afford to get the services that they need and be able to live in a safe environment with um, assistance. So we have a number of things that we can all work on, and we'll be coming down the pike. So um, like I said, if you have creative solutions and ideas, feel free to share those too. <clears throat> I had a young man that was in ninth grade that contacted me because he's concerned about the homelessness problem that we have in our state and the fact that it's growing, that he sees kids in his own school that are living in their cars with their families, etc., or going from shelter to shelter because they can only stay for a week at a time. So he said, Senator martinez Humani. Why can't we ask the cities to plan for tiny house communities to house the homeless? Great idea, right? Tiny houses have been around for a long time. I was excited about it because I had mentioned that to our city manager years ago when they first came out saying, hey, this would be great as starter homes for people or if they were one level, non-movable, but one level, they would be great for people who don't need a yard, can't keep up with the yard, but need a roof over their heads and having their own space, and aren't yet ready to go into an assisted living facility. So when we were doing and interviewing the governor's appointees <coughs> to the housing board, I mentioned that to them. All of them were sitting there writing down notes. So that may be something that they will consider in the future because of this young man coming and saying, I have this idea, do you think it could work? A lot of ideas could work, it's just finding the ways to make them work. So that's where you all come in. I always like it when people bring us um, potential issues, but when you do, it's great if you can also have an idea for a solution. Because putting minds together, we can come up with something that may work that you know you didn't think about on your own, I didn't think about, the person sitting next to you didn't think about, but collaboratively, we can come up with a great innovative way to make things happen. And that's how businesses continue to survive during economic downturns. That's how we all try to live our lives every day successfully. 
Some are more successful than others, probably, but, um, and some are a little happier than others, but we have that opportunity every single day. So um, I look forward to working with you. I don't know if you have any other questions, but I have look forward to working with you. And um, come down to the Capitol. It's an awesome place. And our committee hearings are actually, the Senate ones are on the third floor. We have specific committee rooms. If there's a contentious or potentially contentious issue, it will be on the second floor in the biggest room in the Capitol, which was remodeled last year. It's room 271. Or um, if it's a house bill uh, and you need to go and testify for a house bill, that will be in the basement. Their committee rooms are in the basement. But I highly encourage you to come down there. Number one, it's an awesome building. Number two, there's a lot of lawmaking that goes on there that you should be involved with. And number three, you know, you should be proud of our state and you guys elected us to serve you. Maybe not individually elected me, but you've elected your elected officials down in the legislature to serve you. Allow them to do their public service and help them do that so that we can be a great model for the rest of the country. How many of you been to our um, legislative reception that we hold held in uh, January? This is one of the ways that you can actually get into the same room and rub elbows with um, senators, with um, state representatives, and also this past year we also had the Senate president that was there. So um, it's fun to actually talk to these individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis and to know what bills they're working on and know what they're passionate about.